We're going to look at a, a story. I hope it's going to be fun. Uh, uh, looking at in, in Exodus chapter 17. Uh, here it is. Let's read it, and then we'll try and pull some stuff out of it. While the people of Israel, 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 while the people of Israel uh, were still at uh, Wephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight for the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow, I will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. I'm sure Joshua was like, really? So I'm fighting, and you're standing on the hill, holding a staff? But Joshua did what Moses had commanded, and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. So his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. After the victory, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it aloud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Here's the first thing. It's a piece of truth that you're going to get from the scriptures. I hope you receive this and accept it in love. You will face hardship. You will face hardship. We've heard about endurance's hardship from birth. She didn't get choice. That's the case for many of you. You will face hardship. The Exodus narrative is the parallel to the Christian life. If you look at what happens in Exodus, it shows you what you should expect to happen to you if you become a Christian. There's a birth moment. You're you're born again in water and spirit. It's like you cross the Red Sea. And you hope for the future is glory to enter the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the hope of what used to be called heaven, and I think more helpful to this is everything made new. That's the hope in the future. What lies between salvation and the promised land is a vast and terrible wilderness where you wander through and the presence of God is with you to help you not only make it through, but actually to be a source of life and blessing and hope. And so we see this is what happens in the discipleship phase of Israel. In the discipleship phrase, Exodus chapters 15 to 40, they run out of water and then they find some water, but the water's bitter. And so what do they do? Well, then Moses throws a twig into the pool and it becomes fine to drink. They have hunger. There's no food. And so they cry out to God and there's a miraculous provision of manna and quail. They're attacked by the Amalekites. Uh, Now, the Amalekites actually were basically a sub-tribe of Egypt, So if you think about Israel have escaped from Egypt and they've been liberated from slavery to Egypt and the Amalekites have looked and thought, oh, Pharaoh's slaves, yeah, we're going to now, they're they're no longer under Pharaoh, let's go get them for ourselves. So what this attack of Amalek actually is trying to drag you back into the slavery that you previously lived in. That's what the attack of the Amalek tribe is. Uh, Then again, there's no water and so Moses strikes a rock. And Moses is like so stressed with trying to sort everything out. And Jethro shows up to give him wisdom about how to do it. And then we see the giving of the law and the temple. And uh, straight after that, a golden calf of idolatry and then a plague and on and on and on and on. So listen, in this discipleship phase of your life. Now, if you might be here and you might be thinking about, do I want to become a Christian? And let me tell you, it's the best decision you can possibly make. It's your life is better as a Christian, but it isn't easier as a Christian. You will face hardship as a Christian. You will face hardship anyway, but as a Christian, you will face hardship. It's part of the discipleship journey. Why does God let you face hardship as a Christian? He uses it to train you in the way of being like him. He uses it to train you in holiness and to train you in mission. And so, uh, your quick aside, if you're thinking kind of person, you'd be like, what, you're telling me that my life's better with hardship? Like, let's just think about this. Uh, there's two understandings in our culture, I think, of hardship, right? Two understandings of hardship. If Leslie gets home to me and, she say, and I say, how are you doing? You know, as I, as I do, how are you, darling? And she'll say, I've had a hard day. I've had a hard day. Then I'll say, oh, golly, tell me about that. Like, what happened? 
what was hard about the day? And then she'll say, oh, you know, something about this went wrong or that wasn't good or this thing didn't happen, right? It's a hard day. That kind of hard is bad. Yeah, we all know that, right? If somebody comes and says to you, have you had a hard, you know, how's your day? It's been a hard day. You don't go, hey, that's great. Wow. Like, hallelujah. You don't say that. It's been a hard day. Now, when Leslie comes back sometimes to the house and she's dressed in her gym kit, and I say, how was your session? She say, it was a hard session. And I don't say, oh golly, tell me about it. What made it so hard? I say, was it? And she says, and I loved it. This trainer is the best trainer there is at the gym. I love it. Now, there's a hard that's good, and there's a hard that's bad. What makes a difference, right? What's the difference? Well, the difference in whether something that's hard is good or hard is bad is whether there is a greater purpose that sits above the hardship into which you understand the hardship is working towards. Now, if you've had a hard day, if you've had a hard birth, if you've had hard things happen to you, you look at that and you think, what could possibly be a bigger purpose over this that could have it's just made my life worse? That's bad. But if you have, I want to become stronger than my husband. I want to become somebody who's stronger. I I want to have bigger muscles than any woman I look at. When you then go to the gym and they make you work hard, the greater purpose of Leslie Thompson becomes the powerlifting champion of the UK is being worked towards. And so it's good hardship. Do you understand? You understand? Now, I'm not telling you that as a Christian, your life will be easier. That's never in the scriptures, anywhere, anywhere. It's never easier. But all over the scriptures, we see this. God says there is a greater purpose over your life. I'm calling you as a Christian, not just to say, I love you and I want to be with you forever. No, 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 no. That's not what it is to become a Christian, that God says he loves you and wants to be with you forever. That's some of it. But he says, I call you. I see in you purpose. I see in you value. I'm going to use you to minister my goodness and my life to the world. You're going to become like me. You're going to be transformed so that in every circumstance you walk into, what you say and how you respond will become what is called holiness. You'll become a person who represents me to the world. That's the point of what Christianity is. That's what discipleship is towards. Now, so therefore in hardship... God will always work in any hardship. He will always work for your good. He will always work to transform you through it, to make you more like him, to show you things about yourself you need to, you know, he wants to change and work on, and to enable you to become a person who's more able to sympathize and show kindness to those who are also in hardship. That's the purpose of hardship in the Christian life. That's the purpose of life in discipleship. And it causes us, therefore, to pray. Now, when I wasn't a Christian, if something hard happened to me, I remember the primary response I had was, well, there's no purpose here other than this person's being mean to me. Like, you've done something to me which is horrible, and therefore I'm angry with you. Anger. I just feel like anger is my primary response to something that hard that happened before I was a Christian. When I became a Christian, I believed God loved me and he had a purpose for my life. And so if something hard happened to me, I thought, well, God, I thought you had a purpose for my life. My primary experience as an immature Christian of hardship was it discouraged me. It discouraged me. It made me think God isn't really doing things in my life. God isn't really using me because if he was, there wouldn't be hardship. Do you see the link? But now I know that If God is really for me and wanting to transform me, now I know hardship is one of the primary tools he uses to transform me, to make me into somebody who trusts him and prays and calls him prayer. Now that's not easy, but it is better. It's better. It's training. So here's the question. When hard times come for you, maybe you're in a hard time right now. Maybe today's a really hard day. Maybe it is. And I'm never, ever does God deny it's hard. Never. 
He never denies its heart. I want to suggest to you that you come up with probably one of three things. You fight, you flee, or you flop. Now, the flee hardship is basically hedonism. It's all that matters is that I feel good. So if this is hard, I'm going to flee. I'm going to run away from this. I leave this relationship. I run away from this job. I, I move. I need to find a new church. This church got a bit tricky. This small group I'm in, these guys, it feels hard going to this small group. I'm going to find a new space to go to. You flee it. Or uh, often a fair bit of anger and desire to see the bad situation exposed or punished. You flee. Another thing is where uh, you flop. Now, this is called stoicism. Stoicism is basically, well, we should all suffer in life. It's just part of life. Just embrace it. There's good, there's evil. Part of life, to understand life, is just to accept it. Just accept it. There's just horrible things that will happen to you. And the third option is you fight it. You fight evil. You fight hardship. And that is Christianity. That is Christianity. God's purpose is to see all evil defeated, to see blessing come to every family on the earth. And so when hardship comes, the Christian response is to fight it. We fight hardship. We fight evil. Moses doesn't look and say, oh, look, you know, here come the Amalekites. Well, guys, I better go off and get some time to my own. I'm already stressed about this water in the rock. Like just, you know, I hope you guys do okay, but I'm out of here because this is too hard a situation for me. He doesn't do that. Moses doesn't look at the Amalekites and say, well, this must be the will of the Lord. Hardship's coming on us. It must be the will of the Lord. It's all just part of life. It's just, you know, good and bad. We just embrace it. No, what is he? He's like, come on, let's fight. Let's fight against this. Now, we've been contending for a spiritual awakening. Uh, and contending is a fighting word. We didn't say let's fight for a spiritual awakening because fight is kind of, it means different things in our language today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been interceding at silly times in the morning, and we've been fasting. Uh, I hate fasting. I really, 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 really hate fasting. I hate it. It's like, my life is hard. Let's take more hardship and put it into my life. Like, why? Why would you do that? I've had to fight that voice that says, come on, like, your life is a busy, it's a hard enough day anyway. Like, just kind of, don't add more in. Just kind of go without. Just, you know, do what's nice. Uh, And my answer to that ultimately is, God has made me to fight against all that's evil. We are in a time where fighting is necessary, where contending is necessary. We see that there are enemies against us, there's situations in this life which are negative, and we must If we want to see evil defeated, we must be the ones to say, let's use the agency that God's given us. Let's fight against this. Let's fight against others who are back in the same circumstance I was in. I grew up, I don't want any child ever to experience what I experienced as a child. What's that? It's fighting talk. It's fighting talk. That's what it is. It's fighting talk. Now, uh, just to kind of, Today's my birthday, right? So I, I kind of was like, I was like, thank you. Um, I was considering whether to tell you this or not, and I thought I'd tell you. Um, so part of me was like, well, what idiot organized prayer and fasting on, on my birthday? And I realized it was me. I was that idiot who did that. <laughs> and so I, part of me was like, well, I mean, I couldn't possibly pray and fast on my birthday. I mean, what? it's my birthday, right? It's my birthday. And uh, we had a lovely, lovely, lovely dinner yesterday. Uh, and we, you know, I kind of done dawn till dusk most days if, if we've been able to make it in fasting. But I just thought to myself, like, Lord, what, what is a birthday? What is a birthday? Surely a birthday is a day where you recognize not just that you were born, but what you were born for. And what is a birthday if not just to think, God, I pray your blessing on this next year, but Lord, I pray that you would make me a blessing to others this next year. So what is a birthday if not a day to fight? Like, what is a birthday if not a day to contend? So like, do you know what? I'm going to fast my birthday because I want the rest of my life. I'm 43 years old. 43 years old. I'm becoming an old man. 
I now have to wear reading glasses. Would you like to see my reading glasses? Right, just before I show you my reading glasses, let me tell you, I was quite excited about showing my glasses to my dad because he's worn glasses his whole life. And so I said to my dad, oh, Dad, I've got glasses, can I show them to you? And he said, yeah, 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 let me show them to you. And so when I got them out and put them on, he looked, and my dad is like one of the most encouraging people in the his, on the history of the planet. Now, he always says lovely things about me all the time. And when I put them on, he went, um, 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 uh. Well, they look, um, I must say they look, um, well, they, I mean, I mean they, well, they look really modern. <laughs> Prepare to see the modern glasses. There we are. I'm an old man. I'm 43. And I, I you know, I'm probably, I'm, ha I'm probably halfway cooked, right? I, no, no, no. I'm serious. I feel before the Lord I'm probably halfway cooked. I'm probably like, if I get to 84, 85, I'll be delighted. Don't think I'll get into 86. I don't think I will. And so I'm like, God, for the next 43 years, let me contend. Let me contend. Let me contend for a spiritual awakening. Let this be what I'm for. And that's what I was born for. And just in case you're worried, I was also born to eat steak and eat cake. And at 4 p.m., I'll be finishing the fast and I'm going to stuff my face. Because that's what I was born for as well, the celebration of feasting. So we fight in prayer, right? We fight in prayer. I want to encourage you, when you see a battle, you see something coming in to steal things from you, from people you care about, fight. We fight. We fight. That's what it is to be a Christian. You oppose evil. You fight for what's good. You do it in prayer. Okay, so let's get into the detail. How do we do this? Some practical tips. We fight in prayer. So make appointments to pray. Make appointments to pray. Number one, I used to just try and pray. I used to just try and pray. I should pray. I should pray more. Some people say they pray more. I think, oh, yeah, I should pray more. And then I worked out, oh, if you make an appointment to pray, you're more likely to pray. So Moses, verse 9, I would put my, I can't read this now. I'm, he says, you go and fight. And he says, and tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm going to go on that hill and pray. That's what he says, isn't it? So I'm going to go and pray. Now he makes an appointment to pray. It's just a very simple thing. Jesus tells the parable of the persistent widow about prayer. And she just persists and she gets the answer to prayer. What's he telling us? He's telling us, you just got to pray. So make appointments to pray. Are you making appointments to pray? If I took out your phone right now and said, hey, show me what you've got coming up this week, would there be in it a slot which says, pray, pray here, come on, pray? Like, do you have an appointment to pray? Just make an appointment. Just make it. Now, when I was uh, just getting going in the faith, a guy said to me, look, just 10 minutes, I told you this last week, 10 minutes, make a 10-minute appointment every day to pray. And I'm a good boy, so I did it. And, and, and you know what? I prayed more having made appointments than before I made appointments. So just make, make some appointments. Just right, right now, right now, look at your phone, look, think about your week. What is the appointment you're going to make to pray? When are you going to do it? Just make those appointments. Now, that's it. Yeah, so grab your phone and put on your phone the appointments you're going to pray. Okay, make appointments to pray. Now, some of you are like... <laughs> I mean, I started making appointments to pray years ago. I don't need you to... This is the best you've got? Tell me, make an appointment to pray? I've got more. I've got more. Second point. So make an appointment to pray, or appointments to pray is better. Appointments to pray. So my appointment to pray is every morning, I pray. Every morning... I pray. That's my appointment to pray. That's what I do. Every morning I pray. I pray. Because there's lots of battles in my life. There's lots of battles in Croydon. There's lots of battles in this church. There's lots of battles in my kids' lives. I'm going to make an appointment to pray. So I make an appointment to pray. I just, every morning I pray. 
Second point, pray where it's easy to pray. This is a really important point that most people don't think about. Moses goes up a hill to pray. Why does Moses go up the hill to pray? Well, it could be so he could see the battle, right? Maybe. But actually, more likely, I think, are two reasons. First of all, in the midst of the hectic battle, it would be hard to really pray. So he gets away to pray. But secondly, Moses has previously met with God on a hill. The burning bush, God reveals himself to Moses. It happens on a hill. So Moses, like, oh, where have I met with God in the past? Oh, up a hill. I think if I walked up a hill, as I'm walking up the hill, I will expect, I will have faith that God will hear my prayers when I'm up the hill. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the place where I have faith that God will hear my prayers. I will walk up the hill to pray. Do you know where you have greater faith that God will hear your prayers compared to other places. So I know in my living room, I have almost zero faith to pray. I don't know why. I sit in my living room. The sofa's nice and comfy. The TV is very alluring. The snack cupboard, even though it's not in the room, is suddenly constantly in my thoughts. If I try and pray in my living room, I do terrible praying. If I pray in my dining room, on a hard chair, I don't know why. I have no explanation for it other than over and over again, in that very room, I've seen God meet people. I've seen God answer my prayers. So what do I do in my dining room? I pray. And if I want to make an appointment to pray, I go to the place that I have faith that God will hear my prayers. Now, God is a God everywhere. He could hear me anywhere, but I find it hard to hear him and engage with him everywhere. So I go to the place that's easy to pray. So in your appointment, now write down where you're going to go to pray. Where you're going to go. Where are you going to go to pray? I know, it's unbelievable. There's a, a sermon where they expect you to do something. But that's what I'm expecting you to do. Make an appointment to pray where. Where? Where do you have faith that God would most hear your prayers? It's really hot. I've got a bit left to say. Okay. Uh, pray with authority. He raised his staff. Um, I used to think praying with authority meant shouting. Like, or, you know, I'm going to really try and believe and, th- you know, God, this will happen. And I realized that's not really praying with authority. Um, the best way to pray with authority is actually to see uh, what endurance did, which is just, like, to, to use scripture. Because he said, God said this is him. He's God you know, said this is what he's going to do. So just find a verse that you like and pray it. That's the best way to pray with authority. Uh, you can shout it if you want. Sometimes I do shout it. I feel like I want to shout this. But you can also whisper it. But it's good to pray scripture. So find scripture and pray it. One of the best, again, one of the best advices I ever got was just find a passage of scripture and pray that passage of scripture. Just pray it. And if you do that, I tell you, it would be really good. But the most important thing I want to tell you from this thing, which you might have missed, which is just so important, is that Moses needs Aaron and her in order to pray enough to win the battle. Did you notice that? It's really deliberately emphasized in the telling of the story. Moses is the most humble man on earth. Moses is described as somebody who isn't like everybody else. He sees God face to face. Moses is the man who has liberated a whole nation out of slavery. God has used him to bring down the greatest power on the planet and to liberate a whole people out of slavery. Like, If there was a conference put on and Moses was the headline speaker, people would fly in from everywhere. This man has got the most mature faith. He's got everything. He's so, he's an incredible Christian. Every room he walk into, people are like, I think that's Moses. Is that that Moses? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I can't believe Moses is here. I can't believe Moses is here. Moses was the daddy. 
and he couldn't pray enough to get the stuff done. Do you understand the point? God will make sure that you yourself, if you pray, will never be able to pray enough to win the battles you need to win. Let me say that again because it's shocking. But God makes sure that you, praying on your own about battles in your life, you can never do enough. You always will need an Aaron and a her to be with you. Is that true, Tom? Is that scriptural? Matthew 18 is a chapter all about where Jesus riffs on greatness, what it is to be great. You think what it is to be great is what the pagans say is to be great. It's to be the strong man, to be able to do it all yourself. That's what you think it is to be great. No, 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 no. To be great is to be like a child. To be great is to, to not deliberately live your life so you don't cause others to sin. To be great is to live like the parable of, of the, pros, the, lo, the parable of the lost sheep. To be great is to forgive 70 times 7. In the midst of that, he tells this. I, if two of you here agree on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Where there's a Moses, we don't know if he will hear. But where there's a Moses and an Aaron and a Her. When you agree, I will take those prayers and they will be powerful and effective. You say, really? Is that what Jesus did? Didn't he say about go and shut yourself away in a room on his own? Didn't he say that stuff? Yes, he did. Pray on your own as well. Pray on your own as well. Receive love directly from your father. Tell him your cares. Tell him your fears. But Jesus, on a hill facing a mighty battle a power is coming to try and attack him and take him back into slavery and prevent him from fulfilling everything that God has with him he's going up a hill it's called the hill of the mount of olives it's got at the top of it a garden which is called the garden of Gethsemane and when he gets to that mountain he doesn't say I'm going to do this on my own he says hey Peter hey James and John, I need you to come with me into this moment because I can't pray this on my own. I need you to pray with me. So if Jesus couldn't do it on his own, Moses couldn't do it on his own, I don't think you can do this on your own. So do you have an Aaron and a her? Do you have... Two or three people who know the battles you're fighting in your life and who will go with you to pray for those battles. Now, in our Western world, we love individualism. We love the idea that I can do this on my own. But Jesus preaches a foreign and strange gospel. He says to you, you need to get an Aaron and a her. Now, almost certainly the battles that you're facing, the hardship that you're in, means you will need two or three others to stand with you, to know what it is that you're praying, and to pray with you. And uh, the reality is, let's just check. Yeah, we're going to run out of time. Uh, but the hope is that every single one of you finds two or three people who say, you know, I'm fighting for my marriage right now. I, I need to fight for my marriage. I'm not just going to surrender to this falling apart. I'm not just going to let this drop. I want to fight for this. I need two or three others. Would you stand for me and pray? Oh, uh, this thing's going on with my kids. They're getting bullied at school. Or I'm not sure where they're at or they're ill. I need somebody to contend. Would you contend with me? I need to fight this battle. I'm not just going to give up. I'm not just going to run away from this thing. I'm going to fight this. Would you be Aaron and her? Would you fight this with me? Would you come and pray? My business, I just really feel like God's put on my heart to create a business or to be in a workplace, to get promoted, to carry responsibility, to become a leader in the community, to be somebody who manages other people. This is a big thing. Would you pray? Would you pray with me that God will make this happen? Would you pray with me that God will make this happen? And it's a weak thing to do this. It's weak. Aaron, I mean, Moses... Ultimately, what does he look like? What does it look like to be a successful prayer? What does it look like to be a successful prayer? It looks like this. And what happens is, they, they, they look at him and they say, Moses, you look tired. Can we hold your hands and lift them up for you? Now, if Moses had been in a lot of the small groups that I've been in, Moses would have said, oh, no, 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 no. 
don't worry about it. There's enough things going on in the world. No, no, I'm fine. But would you help me pray for world peace? You see, there's a vulnerability that's required when you say, this is what I'm fighting for, I want to fight for it. The other mistake is this. They say, oh, Moses, your arms look really tired, can we pray with you? And he says, and and so all the prayers are about Moses' arms. Oh, I've got this, this is a problem, I feel weak in this area, this is a challenge I've got. And he's like, and God's like, yeah, you, you know, just hold his hands up and pray about the battle. Pray about the battle. And so the problem we have in small groups is often that people just won't say what it is they need to pray for. And if they do say what it is they pray for, all we pray for is them, their own personal needs. And God says, get together with others and pray for the battles, pray for the fights. And your thing is part of a bigger fight. Do you know that? Any hardship you're facing is part of a bigger fight. Pray for marriage in Croydon. Pray that God would do something new where people actually can hold it together. There can be an overcoming of relational difficulties. Pray for kids, raising of sons and daughters. Be like, I want my kids to do well. God, can you you break in? Would you do something in Croydon for under-18s? Would it be that they have a better future? Would you do something, God, and include mine in this as well? God, we want to, there's too many boarded up shops in Croydon. Look at it. We walk down the high street and it's depressing. God, I want my business to do well. I want to see you bless me and work. But God, would you do something in Croydon that changes? And not just Croydon, in Birmingham as well, Lord. And across all these other, would you do something, God? Contending prayer with an Aaron and a her. The final thing is uh, so what, we, sorry, so what we want to do is we want to, we're asking our small group leaders, and at the end you'll see them all. They're going to be stood up. we have lanyards around their neck. We're going to say once a month in small groups, do what we're going to call huddle week. Huddle week. Huddle week will be this. In the small group, you'll break into groups of twos or threes or fours, and you'll just go around for one hour. Okay, Andy, you've got 10 minutes. Tell us about your life. What are the battles you're fighting for? What's happened this last month that was... It was discouraging. What are your hopes for this next month? And then we pray for Andy. 15 minutes are gone. We go on to John. John, tell us what's going on in your life. Let's, you tell us. What are the battles you're fighting? What do you want to see God do? What are your worries? Let's pray for him. 15 minutes are gone. Half the session's gone. We go on. We go on. We do an hour. We contend. We're trying to make this easy for you to have this. But you can, of course, do it outside of small group. I mean, you can find it elsewhere. But we're just trying to make it easy for you. Does that make sense? Sound like a good idea? So the final thing is, is then you're going to say, you're now just mentally, if you're in a small group, you're just racking through your brain. You're like, do I want her to be my her? You get it? Like, they're in my small group. Do I want her, you know, that lady in my small group, to be my her, as in my prayer buddy? Yeah, you, you understand. I think it was funnier than you thought it was. Well, let me tell you something. You're probably somebody else's her. And her was a plonker. Yeah. What we know of her in the Bible is two things. Three things. Three things. Sorry, three things. Her was probably married to Miriam. Miriam was Moses' sister. The most famous thing about Miriam is she tried to take Moses' job and tried to take him out of it. Almost certainly with her stood behind her saying, well, Moses, I think she's a much better at this than you would be. Her is a plonker. The other thing that we know why that is because her is one of those who God puts to death in the wilderness because he's been unfaithful and he's worshipped the golden calf. Right? But her fought with Moses to defeat the Amalekites that Israel could step into all of the destiny that God had for them and continue to advance in their life. So guess what? It doesn't matter if the person in your small group is a plonker who you're praying with because if you pray with them, God will hear their prayers and together, two or three gathered in his name, he will do it. So yes, her can be your her. And you can be there, her. All right? Finished.